Don't be afraid to sit next to one another. <laughs> All right. I just want to say uh, good, good morning to everyone here. Uh, thank you so much for joining us uh, this morning. Uh, as you know, uh, Mayor Quentin Hart, uh, proud mayor of the city of Waterloo, uh, and, and so appreciative of, of your time spent. Um, a couple weeks ago, maybe a month ago, I had the distinct opportunity to visit uh, Berlin, Germany, and it was with uh, the PPI, uh, Mr. Will Marshall and Carter and the rest of the staff. Um, and, and, and I'll tell you, uh, it, was, it was simply eye-opening. Uh, because when you take a look at uh, things that are happening throughout this world, uh, uh, throughout this country, uh, to see an organization that's willing to stand up and say, regardless of the politics of the country or the politics of the day, uh, we need to stand together. Uh, whether it's a transatlantic partnership, uh, whether it's standing up for working class families, whether it is trying to get things accomplished that everyday citizens need to have, uh, the PPI was at the forefront. Um, so one of the greatest experiences that you can possibly have. So I'm so fortunate. It's amazing uh, being at a beer garden uh, in, in Germany and the conversations that can come across about the critical needs uh, of our cities and so uh, infrastructure came up in that conversation and they made a commitment that uh, they wanted to be in Waterloo to talk about some of these challenges and issues and so we're, we're so glad and so fortunate uh, that you're here today and so when I tell you um, Will and the rest of the crew and, and I'll use some, some, a little bit of slang uh, but they're really a big deal uh, because it's a big deal for them uh, making sure that our communities are progressing and moving forward. So could we please give Will and the rest of the PPI a, a warm round of applause. Thanks so much, uh, Mayor Hart. has been a really uh, gracious host to us here today in Waterloo and really appreciate uh, your doing that. We did have a chance to, uh, to go to an international conference together in Berlin and I'll tell you, he, he represented Waterloo with great uh, distinction and intelligence and, uh, and, and uh, it was also a lot of this great bow tie, you know, which is why I felt, <laughs> felt I better to tie up today to uh, keep pace. But uh, thanks so much, Mr. Mayor, for having us in your town. It's great to see you again. Uh, and, uh, and also my great friend Tim Ryan, Congressman Ryan, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and being part of this conversation. And uh, Timmy, thank you. I've just met today, but uh, we really appreciate it. What we have here is a wonderful panel that can give us a federal, a state, and a local view on this question of infrastructure that we're talking about. Um, let me just say a word while we're here. You know, PPI has been uh, organizing events in Iowa. This is the third one. We started last December with Tom Philson and Patty Judge talking about public investment, the public investment drought. Then we were here last month with, uh, with uh, Governor Hickenlooper and other local Iowa leaders to talk about universal affordable health care and how we get there. And today, you know, our topic is modernizing America's infrastructure. What are we waiting for? So this is the third in a series of forums that are designed to draw attention to what we think are the critical questions that the voters have to resolve in this 2020 election, but also to point the way toward what we think are the progressive solutions that uh, we hope our candidates will embrace. And, and taken into this race. Um, and uh, so you can kind of tell in our, uh, in our title that there's a sense of impatience here. Uh, and why is that? Well, you know, uh, Donald Trump campaigned on doing something big on infrastructure. Democrats in Washington say that we want to do something big on infrastructure. Uh, so everybody is for it, but nothing seems to be happening. You know, last month we had a big meeting with the president and he brought in uh, Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer, the Democratic leaders, and they agreed on a $2 trillion uh, infrastructure plan. It took about two days for that to unravel as Senate Republicans said, no, sorry, we're not paying for that. <laughs> Can't find the money for it. Uh, certainly not going to raise anybody's taxes to pay for it. Uh, and then the president said, well, the Mexico trade, the Mexico Canada trade deal has to come first anyway. And then he had his famous temper, temper tantrum where he walked out of a, a meeting with the leaders that was supposed to be about funding infrastructure. And instead, went on 
to, uh, to berate them for being for allowing investigations of him to go forward. So, uh, you know, nothing's happened again. This is the second false start. Last year, 2018, he, he came forward with a 1.5 billion a trillion, excuse me, infrastructure plan. It was really a 200 billion dollar one. It was a big number, but it turns out the federal contribution was much smaller. But even on even with that small amount, the Republic, Republicans uh, balked and instead gave priority to the nearly $2 trillion tax bill that they passed, which took all the space in the budget for, uh, for you know, uh, this, is, this is the room in the budget we needed to fund a big infrastructure package. They spent it on tax cuts that we didn't need and came at the wrong time in the cycle instead. So to me, the infrastructure question it offers the clearest example that you could possibly ask for of the dysfunction in Washington. You got an issue everybody claims you're for, and yet there's been zero progress in the last two and a half years. And you could say that it's Donald Trump's biggest unfulfilled campaign promise to make some headway on this. Uh, there's a reason for this deadlock, this impasse, and that is that, you know, and I'm, I'm going to be partisan here, uh, the, the new breed of Republicans who came in, uh, in during the Obama years and took over in Washington uh, view all federal spending as equally bad. Been what I call an outbreak of economic illiteracy in Washington. You know, people can't distinguish between spending on present consumption and and true economic investments that generates dividends and returns that the whole society will reap down down the road. This is how we've always grown as a country. I was reading a little about Mayor about the history of uh, prairie cross turning into uh, Waterloo, and you know, it was all transportation uh, that uh, transportation infrastructure that helped build so many of the cities out here and, and help them flourish and connect them. So, um, you know, when we stop, so we're chronically underinvesting as a nation uh, for, for years. You know, when I was growing up, America was the most modern country, everything, the airports, the, the, high, the interstate highway system. Uh, we, we sort of, you know, the American way of life was set the global standard. Now we've dropped a ninth in infrastructure quality according to the World Economic Forum. China, meanwhile, which is trying to eclipse the United States in every way possible, is, is, is kind of, uh, building infrastructure at a breakneck pace. And that nation building, is, and that's what we're really talking about, at home is a huge national priority. I've been looking at a lot of polling lately. And when you ask people, you know, how do we make America stronger, they're not saying, oh, well, let's put more money into the, the military budget. They're saying, let's rebuild the basis, the foundations, the backbone of our market economy at home, make it stronger, more prosperity, more, and spread that prosperity more broadly. That's how America can regain its standing in the world, its influence in the world, the strength from which we can lead in the world. So uh, there's no question where the public is on this. So we've got a, we got a, you know, a problem, and only voters can can break this problem by sending the kind of leaders to Washington who are serious, who are pragmatic rather than dogmatic, who will find the money, who will get the job done, who will find a way to compromise the, the lost arts of governing that you know, don't happen in Washington anymore. Um, and uh, before I turn it over to our distinguished speakers to elaborate on all these uh, thoughts, but I want to say that you know, there's, another, I think, another thing we need besides new leaders, and that's a new vision of what the federal government's role is. You know, the federal government got involved in infrastructure in a big way right after World War II to build the interstate highway system, bipartisan achievement. Republican president, Democratic Congress spent the money. Well, the highway system was completed in 1986. And we don't really have a kind of compelling definition of, of Washington's leadership role, the federal government's leadership role in, uh, in, in infrastructure. We've got a lot of little programs, a lot of stovepipe funding streams that come down. But we don't really know what we want Washington to do. We haven't sorted out the division of labor between what Washington does and what states and localities do very well. I want to propose, before I get off here, just uh, an idea. And that is this new strategic priority for the federal government's contribution to infrastructure, which, by the way, is only about 14% of all the spending on infrastructure in America, that its, its role ought to be to deconcentrate uh, opportunity. You know, we have uh, most new opportunities in America are clustered in a handful of big coastal cities, Seattle, San Francisco, Los Angeles, New York, Boston. Uh, that's where most of the investment goes, where most of the jobs get created. Uh, and we have to have a concerted national strategy of seeding the ground elsewhere across the country, particularly in the vast middle of the country, between the coasts. <coughs> Uh, for new investment, for new startup activity, for next generation manufacturing. Not, you know, uh, uh, we're not giving up on manufacturing. Uh, we want to, we want to, you know, create uh, new, uh, new kinds of manufacturing in America in the places where people know how to do it. 
So uh, we think that this that that should be the new kind of north star of the federal government's role: how to spur <coughs> innovation and startups in the places left out of today's prosperity, the old industrial centers, the small towns uh, and rural communities of the country. Uh, you know, across the heartland, obviously, I don't need to tell you all this, but you need more and better airports, you need highways, and you need to fix your decrepit bridges, rail, and safe drinking water are huge problems all over the place. You can locks and dams and levees that are protected, riverside cities like Waterloo and Davenport. Uh, we need to do more investment to deal with more high frequency uh, flooding that's happening, which is probably a climate change related uh, event. And so, but we've got to be, we have to think regionally and spatially about this. Where we're driving the investment, our view is it ought to be here. Uh, finally, I would just say that, um, you know, uh, it's not, not a coincidence that we're in Iowa. This is uh, ground zero in the next presidential uh, debate. And, and the Midwest generally, I think, is where this next election is going to be decided. Uh, and we just found that uh, voters out here in Iowa really take these issues more ser seriously than uh, people in Washington. That's why we like to do these events, and I uh, love to do, get with our with leading Iowans to talk about them. And we always have great uh, folks come out and uh, and, uh, and ask really great questions and engage in these conversations. So that's what we're doing today. It's a conversation. We're gonna we're gonna have, we're gonna hear from our panelists, but we we'll also want to hear from you. So uh, as after some some talk up here, we'll ask you all to, to offer your thoughts. So with that, and without further ado, let me also thank Hawkeye Community College. And this is a great facility kind of sign of the bustle I'm seeing around Waterloo, this, uh, this new building, and thank you all for, for hosting us here. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and, and and Jeff Link and, and Katie Sidek and Pita Alessandro, without our Iowa partners, we wouldn't be here. PPI and Washington-based think tank is not going to be organizing great events like this without our Iowa partners. So thank you all for, for everything you've done to make this work. So, without further ado, let's hear from our, our uh, from our special guests here. And I'm going to start with my friend, uh, Congressman Tim Ryan. Uh, Tim has been a strong voice for heartland values in the Congress of the United States since what 2000, like 2002. Now, uh, eighth term, uh, he's been a relentless advocate for working families. You know, he, he represents Northeast Ohio, Youngstown, uh, kind of a, the, the buckle of the Rust Belt, if you will. Uh, and he's been. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on your resume because I think folks know you're going to get to me. But from my point of view, what's really important that he's been an important voice in the Democratic Party's internal discussions about direction and strategy and who and what we have to do to be successful, how we build a majority, how do we make sure that we deny this uh, person in the White House a second term. And, uh, you know, we've got to be serious about that. The stakes are enormous, and Tim has been a voice that's says the party, you know, we have to learn how to win in the heartland again, in the Midwest. We have to talk to working people. We need to be present. We need to show up. We need to listen. And we need an agenda that connects to their lives in a way that, frankly, the Democratic agenda sometimes has not done. So with that, uh, Tim, over to you. And then we'll go. Thanks.
they are long-term structural issues that need changed in the United States. And we need a big agenda coming out of Washington, D.C. And it's not just about money, but it is about money, too, because you can't build a road without money. A tax cut for the top 1% does not build roads. It doesn't build hospitals. It doesn't pay teachers more. It doesn't provide mental health coverage. I mean, these are the issues that are facing the country. And I love the phrase economic, uh, economically illiterate. And I'm going to steal that, and if anybody says, Will gave it to me, I'm going to be very mad at you, because I'm going to act like that's my own. Um, because I think it is indicative of where we are today. You have to make these investments, uh, these public investments, that are critically important. So I'm not going to talk too long, because I would love to have a give and take, but I do want to lay out what I think is the situation when we're talking about why. You know, we say we need more roads, we need more bridges, we need more broadband, we need more investments in this, that, or the other. Why? Two main reasons I can see. One is the erosion of the middle class. These investments are critical to lifting people back up. So we make these investments so that communities like Waterloo, like Youngstown, Ohio, like Warren, Ohio, these small little towns that I represent, have an opportunity to grow. And what Will said about transportation, uh, transportation spending is concentrated. So is venture capital. 80% of venture capital goes to three states, California, New York, and, and Massachusetts. Okay, so we have all of this, the in public investments, the private investments that can really lift up communities and help transform communities uh, are all concentrated now. 9% of venture capital goes to women, uh, less than 2% goes to uh, uh, African Americans, less than 2% go to Latinos. So it's concentrated. And so that's one. And number two is, and it's been mentioned already a little bit, we are in a direct competition with China. Direct. Our kids, our grandkids, direct competition with China. And you know what China's doing? That their infrastructure, they're building islands. Islands in the South China Sea. We can't get money for roads. They're building islands. And then we said, well, don't militarize them. A couple years later, there's bases on them. And they're flying airplanes on and off. Right? They have, they're building ports, buying ports, building ports all over the Middle East, all over Asia. They have a rail line that goes from northeast China to Rotterdam. To Rotterdam. Okay? That's their commitment. Gas lines, you know, oil. Everything, right? Roads, bridges. They are connecting what was the old Silk Road. That's their commitment. And here we are competing with them directly, and we can't get an infrastructure bill. And so I just want to say this uh, before I sit down. Um, it's not just money. It is money, but it's not just money. And I think we as Democrats, as progressives, we have got to say we've got to get this government working again. It's not working. And it's our responsibility to get it working. When you go back to the New Deal, when you go back to Franklin Roosevelt, they were making the government work for the people. And Roosevelt used to say, this is what government is for, for the people. That's why we organize ourselves. And, and so we've got to get it working. And that means uh, one of the studies uh, that I was reading from PPI, that it's $1.7 billion per kilometer for the New York, for a New York subway project. $1.7 billion. A similar project in Paris or Copenhagen is $250 million. Okay? One point, did you guys hear me? $1.7 billion in New York, $250 million in Copenhagen or Berlin. So, we have a responsibility to the taxpayers, middle class people working hard, playing by the rules, can barely keep their nose above water, money, send money in, and this is what we do with it. So it's got to be, yeah, we need more money, but I don't care if you're talking to someone who makes a billion dollars a year or $50,000 a year. If you're paying taxes, we have a responsibility to spend that in an effective and efficient way. It's disrespectful to the taxpayer. And so that's what we need to talk about when we're talking about these, these infrastructure pro, pro, uh, projects because if we do that right, we can ask for more money and get more done and uh, make sure that these communities are plugged in. When we talk about federal spending, and the mayor knows this, 
these communities around here, a lot like, as I said, the ones I represent, we've lost a lot of our tax base. We've lost the steel mills. We just had a General Motors facility go from 16,000 workers down to zero. And just in the last two years, went from 3,000 down to zero in the supply chain, the ripple effect, the seat manufacturer, logistics company. So we've lost our tax base, and Republicans are saying, well, go pull yourself up by your bootstraps. And we don't have boots. <laughs> right? So we need a federal agenda, because if Youngstown's going to get plugged in, if Waterloo's going to get plugged in, then we need these investments. Why? Because we're competing against China, who's spending 7 to 9% of their GDP on infrastructure. That's why. And I believe if we're going to win elections, we've got to tell people why. You can't just say, I'm going to do this and do that. Here's my, here's my laundry list. And, and so these conversations that we're having about local, state, and federal, and organizing this in a 21st century, century way are critically important for us to have a, a national discussion about how to do this. And so I'm thankful to be here. I look forward to getting into the nuts and bolts about all the great things going on in Washington around infrastructure. <laughs> I hope um, one day. Um, and, and the reality is I think the best thing we could do as progressives is paint the big picture about our competition, paint the big picture why, and paint the big picture how it's going to help individuals. Because if we make these investments, that means economic growth for you here in Waterloo, and that means job creation here in Waterloo, that means an increased tax base here in Waterloo, which means more money for your schools in Waterloo, and all the other infrastructure projects that you may have. So I look forward to that discussion. Thank you so much for having me. We got in about one in the morning. I love the way the city looks in the daytime. Couldn't see it at all at night. And that the hotel that's been refurbished from the John Deere, yeah. unbelievable. Um, I mean, as an economic development guy, I love to see that. So, look forward to more conversation. Thank you.
We do a lot for special interests and corporations that aren't really bringing in vast number of economic development or, or numbers of employees, and we don't do the infrastructure and the water and the education and the human resource issues. So I think if we, we prioritize, Iowa could do a lot better from the state level coming down, um, providing you know monies that we need need to increase our infrastructure. So that's I'll leave it kind of there because I want everyone to kind of talk and ask questions, but. Um, from this here on point, Iowa can do a lot better, we should be doing better. We've identified, we've set meetings, we have a plan, we just aren't implementing. Thank you. Uh, you know, and, and you, you've kind of highlighted one of the, the, the things that the federal government can and should do is these sort of gaps here to fill you know, where, where, the, where the physical capacity is lacking. You're going to have to get, you're gonna get, have to get some help. Uh, with the motion, particularly when you have pretty much an emergency in the fund, we're just uh, now, Mr. Mayor, back to you. Please tell us, you know, about Waterloo and your infrastructure challenges, and, and maybe reflect a little too on Washington and what you're not getting from Washington, Virginia. All right, thank you. Um, it, 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 you know, hearing, hearing this, and something is just uh, uh, really shocked me. And you know, as the Progressive Policy Institute. Um, the fact that in 2019, uh, you have to lead the charge for a progressive policy changes over quality water, over uh, infrastructure on roads and bridges. How is it that that has become a progressive, progressive <coughs> When those are the very essentials that people every day need within our communities. Think about how far uh, we've gone back as a country. You know, and, and our, our infrastructure needs uh, is a very delicate balancing act. And it's, you know, uh, think about it. Another thing, how is it that if we don't necessarily agree with someone that may sit on the right side of the council chamber, and someone that may sit on a left perspective of the council chambers, and because they don't agree on a particular issue, I go back to the staff and say, you know what, we're not going to do anything today. We're going to have the council shut down. You know, that doesn't work in the real lives of everyday people, and that doesn't work with the expectation of those that have voted for us to put us in this position. That mindset doesn't work in the real world because people have real issues. You know, just the other day, um, a couple weeks ago, uh, we found out that there was a leak, uh, a, a forced main leak, uh, in one of our areas. And some of that seepage was moving into uh, the Cedar River. And we had to move to start to try to take uh, aggressive actions to mediate that situation. And during the council meeting, um, one of our council people asked, well, how long have those pipes been there? You know, has it been since the 1950s? Has it been through since the 1800s when some of our pipe infrastructure was put in place in our city? Then we take a look at our uh, treatment plant. Right now, because some of the, some of the changes that are coming forth uh, from the EPA and the DNR, you know, we are in a position where we need to make probably 90 to $100 million of infrastructure changes in our treatment plans. And then now we take a look at our climate, climate changes, or whatever you want to call it, but all I know, whatever we call it on the national level, all I know is we had two 500-year floods in 10 years. 500, two in 10 years. And then also you compile that with the fact that we had the wettest, wettest uh, September in history of the almanacs when we first started tracking uh, precipitation. And then combine that with the fact that we had the most severe winter and snowfall winter and ice than we probably had in the last hundred years. So all these changes we're seeing have become the new normal for our communities. And so we need a partner in Washington that is willing to 
roll up the sleeves and say, this is important. This isn't just a progressive policy. This is something that people need for their basic fundamental lives. And so we had an opportunity to go as the Cedar Valley Coalition. I think Tom went with us. Uh, Kevin from our intercog had gone. And folks had gone to Washington, D.C. to meet with our uh, congressional reps and our senators uh, to tell them about uh, the plans that we need to just make our cities that much better to meet the basic needs. And so we're focused uh, as a city. We're focused. But the amount of needs that we have are insurmountable. Right now, um, I think, Will, you walked yesterday yeah. up the Park Avenue Bridge. And then uh, we also can go to the 11th Street Bridge. Uh, $6 million apiece. Uh, we were fortunate enough to submit uh, information to the federal government uh, because those are two of probably the top 30 worst bridges in the entire state. And we're still waiting to hear back whether or not those bridges have been approved. And at the same time, the erosion and things that are taking place with the conditions are making them even worse. We only bond, I think this year we bonded about $10 million. Those bridges are $12 million, and they need work right now. And so we're looking for a partner, we're looking for uh, candidates that come through here that are going to work across the aisle to get things done to make sure the basic needs are met within our communities. And I won't even get on roads and, and other issues and broadband. I'll leave it at that for right now, but uh, we need a Washington that works on behalf of uh, real people with real issues and real communities.
protect the environment, protect our friends in labor who are doing these projects and make the argument we're going to get even more projects done because we're going to get this process moving and if we can streamline it, we're going to have more money to do more projects. I think it's critical for us to, to take the, the leadership role on that uh, and if we don't, then you get either them pushing it through, the other side pushing it through and eviscerating the EPA, kind of like what they're trying to do now and they are doing in some ways, uh, or you get gridlock. And so I think we should be talking about how we are going to do this, we should take this mantle and run with it and make it part of our agenda. And from the state level, we've actually, this session, we kind of regressed because we did, we're taking away local control. And we, and we have actually for the last five years, but this year we passed the property tax reform bill, which won't lower anybody's property tax in this room, I can guarantee you. Um, and during discussion, that property tax reform bill changed into a more comprehensive bill, it turned into a, more, a better communication bill, it turned into a transparency bill, none of which is going to help Waterloo or the mayor and the city council get things done. So we capped what they can do. So really from the state level, we have regress on what our local folks can do from the infrastructure standpoint. So we're not, we're not being proactive at this point either. Um, but I, I live in the minority, minority, minority down in Des Moines, and that's just not the priorities again. Well, let me ask a, a, a question about how you pay for all of this, and then we'll throw this conversation open uh, to you all. Uh, you know, uh, Senator Russell Long, legendary Southern Democrat, very powerful in the Senate for decades, used to have a little poem, you know, every time they talk about tax policy, you know, don't tax you, don't tax me, tax that fellow behind a tree. And so uh, one of the problems we have in infrastructure is, you know, everybody's for more of it, uh, but uh, they don't want to pay for it. Everybody's kind of pointing to somebody else to pay for it. Uh, you know, the, the kind of conventional wisdom in Washington now in Congressman is that debts don't matter anymore. It's, there's no political upside in caring about deficits, tackling the issue. Uh, and the Republicans, as we pointed out earlier, given the choice between spending over a trillion dollars on infrastructure and a big fat two trillion dollar tax cut, yeah. pick the tax cut that, as you pointed out, doesn't create common economic goods that benefit all of us. So, uh, you know, is there any hope of finding a new political configuration that can get the money that we need that will actually go down on floor and vote for some combination of higher taxes and, uh, and uh, spending cuts or offsets to make this happen? Yeah, we talked about um, no now. <laughs> I think it's going to take it's going to take a, the next political cycle. I think it's going to take a new president, and quite frankly, it's going to take a new Senate. There's no way uh, we can get this done with Mitch McConnell as the leader of the Senate. It's just not going to happen. And so we have to dislodge him as well, and dislodge the Republicans in the Senate. And then I think there's an opportunity for us to say, okay, instead of focusing on taxing labor, how do we figure out how to tax? capital gains? Uh, how do we talk about the estate tax? How do we talk about these things? There's been such a concentration of wealth over the last 30 or 40 years to where a CEO now is making 300 times plus what the person on the factory floor or the worker is making. It, and 30 some years ago, it used to be 30 times. Now it's 300 times. So we know where the money is and we have to start by going there. And I think making the argument, you know, first winning elections, First, talking about how Democrats are going to make the process work better. First, talk, uh, second, talk about how Democrats are going to make government work. We're the party that defends this stuff. We can't defend the indefensible. Let's get the government working again. And we are going to ask the wealthiest to pay more to help us get this done. And I think we can take some of the poison out of the argument if you're saying, look, we're going to rebuild the system. So we don't think we should ask any taxpayer to dump money into a broken system. So we're going to help streamline that thing. And we're going to ask you to help. And we don't hate you, but you got to help us. This is a national problem. We are competing against China. We are trying to lift up communities that have been left behind. You have a responsibility to, to help you, or to help us make that happen. And I think if you make these broader arguments around competition with China, lifting up the middle class, the fact that you get a 10, 15, or 20% return on the investments that we make, stop talking about things in, in, the, in the context of budget items, talk about things along the lines of investments that we get a return on. And we're going to get a 15 or 20% return on these investments. And if we make these investments in Waterloo, and 
Davenport in Youngstown, that those communities are then going to reap the benefits of the investment. They're going to get 10, 15, 20 percent return, which means they can grow the economy and increase their tax base. And I think laying that out to what I call normal people, uh, they understand that and are willing to do it. And I've talked to people who have a lot of money. Um, I don't know enough of them, but I do know some of them. Um, and, and if they hear something like this, they're willing to help out. But they don't want to throw money down a broken system. You tell them, yeah, we want money for transportation and it costs 1.7 billion per, per kilometer. And they would say, why would I want to give you money when if I was a business person in Germany, it would only be 250 million. You know, so we've got to win that argument, but we're not going to pass legislation. And I think we can if we frame it properly and, and talk to people about the benefits of, of how it happens. But I think the money's got to come from capital gains and figuring out how to get into where the concentration of wealth is and then make the broader argument of, of growth spread and share across the country. Thanks. Uh, I'm Rob
average Americans. Doesn't work out at all. Because, I mean, I'm from Ohio. We're in Iowa. I go to New Hampshire. I go to a lot of other states. I travel around. Everyone's dealing with the same thing all across the country. It's, it's bad everywhere on infrastructure, on water, on sewer, on EPA mandates, uh, on lead in the water, lead, uh, lead paint in some of the older homes that our kids are living in. I mean, in the schools, some of these older schools. It's like, how is this working out for us? It's not. It doesn't work. This does not work. And we need to just go at a beeline. line. It's like it's broken. And it, the economy's not working. It may look like it on TV, on CNBC. You got a lot of stock, or you're, you know, a shareholder in a company. But for the rest of us, it's not working. And, and the second half of that is, imagine what it could be like if we did what we're talking about up here. Imagine what could happen in these communities. We know how it works. We've just got to reclaim that government needs to be a part of this. Collective action on behalf of the citizens needs to be a part of this, or it ain't happening. And their whole strategy of destroying government, destroying unions, destroying the middle class has worked. And look what's happened. It's bad for the rest of us. You got meth, you know, you got a meth problem in Iowa, we've got an opiate problem in, in Ohio. Uh, infrastructure, loss of manufacturing, great, let's just keep going down the line. Like, I'm tired of it. I mean, this, this is not the way I want my kids to live in the United States. And so we got to ask that question, how is it working out under the trickle-down economic theory? Thank you very much. Thanks for bringing up the preemption move. There's a lot of Republican legislatures, red states, that are actively undermining the urban leaders, the metro leaders, and trying to handcuff them and do the things they need to do to, because of so much of the innovation in America, the big political is coming from great mayors to be here. But look, enough from us. Uh, let's hear from you. Do we have a, a microphone that we want to pass around so people can be heard? Or, uh, but please uh, just, uh, yes, sir, we'll get you a microphone. Just identify yourself and then fire away. I don't need a microphone. You can hear me, all right? <laughs> well, I can't. Uh, I had this until the first year, but yeah. I can't go back to you. Um, three things that I think that could be addressed that would be progressive and help with our infrastructure. First would be, uh, you know, President Carter pointed out that uh, while uh, we've been fighting wars, China's been building railroads. So cutting back on our military expenditures and reducing our military footprint around the world would help. The other thing that would help is that uh, the mayor and other mayors throughout Iowa and across the country uh, could establish public banks to make better use of taxpayer dollars rather than have to rely on bonding and sending the taxpayer dollars off to goodness knows where. Uh, the other thing that could be done would be for municipalities uh, to own the state-regulated investor-owned utilities uh, and reduce the cost to citizens of electricity and gas and internet and cable and so on. So those three issues, reducing the military, establishing public banks, and owning uh, uh, our utilities. <coughs> Try to get private capital involved that, uh, that think regionally uh, and uh, that you know we see spread up in places like the West Coast and Chicago. So Chicago's got infrastructure banks. I think that's a terrific idea. Uh, Gary, since you wanted to ask a question, I want to ask you a question first here. What's a sexier word than infrastructure? How can we uh, how can we solve that problem with the mayor? How do we... <laughs> that's my question. That's my question. That's your question. <laughs> well, that's all right. You can just <laughs> That's my question. My question is this. I think as De Democrats, we have a long history of thinking that logic and facts and common sense carries the water. We, we do. We think that that wins. And we saw four years ago and plenty of other instances in our lives where it doesn't. Uh, and, and I don't mean to sound cynical because I'm the least cynical person in the world. But I don't think we carry the water particularly well. The other side does. 
know, they made a contract with America in the mid-90s, and they carried that water farmhouse to farmhouse, and they started at the state level, and, they, and it worked up. And we've always thought, big ideas are going to filter down. And I agree with everything you said. You even answered my question beautifully, Congressman Ryan. But at the same time, I think, as Democrats, we have a marketing problem. And I think until we come up with a marketing solution, what is the paradigm that is going to deliver these messages? I walked door to door and lost my election, but I said the very same things, because we talked about these problems four years ago, too. And now they're bigger. But I'm hearing this, the problems and the solutions, and I, there isn't really an answer to this rambling question. Except that I think that in a forum where we're all together and we're looking at each other, we need to come out of this with some of us exchanging phone numbers and figuring out how to deliver this message together. How to take it to farmhouse to farmhouse. How to carry this water, because that's the way we're, you know, there's one solution. Democrats have to win, top to bottom. But until that time, how do you reach across the aisle with people who are turning their back when you put your hand out? Man, that's a very vague, open-ended question, but I agree with everything that I've heard up here. But I still think, fundamentally, we got to figure out how to take this doorstep to doorstep. Who has, who has, who has an idea? Stole the microphones. One of the things, as you were talking and trying to make it a little sexier, my grandmother grew up on a farm in Atomoff. I grew up in Chicago. And I came back to Iowa when I became a lawyer. And she was interviewed by one of my cousin's kids about the greatest innovation that she has seen throughout her life. She was born in 1913. And she said, Rose, you know, I'm thinking phones, I'm thinking internet, I'm thinking all this stuff. And she's just like, you have no clue what it's like hitching up a horse and going down a muddy road and you can't get 10 feet. And then you got cars, well, they can't get through the mud either. And so I don't know if we can tap back to our history in some sexier way, but it just struck me when, well, my sister wrote up my grandma's life in this book, that road was the thing that struck out in her mind as the biggest thing. And that's, our economy is based on that. So anyway, I hope somebody can take that and run with it and make it sound better. I just want to say that I never thought I'd be in Iowa at an event for an hour and hear the word sexy five different times. <laughs> that is not something I expected this morning, Will. I appreciate it, though. Maybe maybe that's our word. Maybe we just throw the word sexy around and see if it works. What do you think? You're up for it. <laughs> it's out. Democrat or Republican, 
who uh, talk about the, the fact that uh, we don't want to raise taxes, you know. No way, shape, or form we want to raise taxes. And they use as a justification that uh, this will hurt the low-income people. This will hurt the Social Security recipients, those that are on the, quote, dole. Okay. But then in the next breath, this is a double speak. When it comes to raising minimum wage and when it comes to increasing Social Security benefits or expanding it, they vote and they argue against those kind of things. That's garbage and it's BS. It's double speak. But the money issue gets into it when, I mean, you talk about China and other places. Doesn't it, uh, you, you four up there, doesn't it amount to the fact that there's so many complex issues in it? And it includes stuff like um, the cost of labor. Do we agree with worker rights? And Because I don't believe China uh, is really worker right oriented as far as the country. Uh, do, they, do we agree that things should be privatized? I mean, should we have a public-private partnership where the taxpayers pay for the infrastructure and everything that goes with it, but then turn it over to a private country or a private company? to manage it and make money off it and gouge the taxpayers, that's garbage, I think. Okay. Also, it includes eliminating voters, disenfranchising voters, because if the rich and the powerful can eliminate a whole bunch of voters, then they're going to put voters in there, or they're going to have the voters there, that will be their base to get, uh, that can get them uh, elected. So, what I'm saying is that it's a money issue, but the the uh, statement that is made is always about how much is it going to talk, cost the taxpayer. Well, to me, and I would hope you would agree, that taxation shows a community and a society's responsibility to itself. And as a community and as a responsibility, we're lacking, sorely lacking. So, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Um, I'll, uh, I'll address it. First, uh, to the gentleman in the red shirt, I just want to say you're talking about sidewalks and one of the programs that has gotten uh, flatlined and cut over the last 10 years uh, has been the Community Development Block Grant Program in which we, from the federal government, send money down to the local communities so that they can spend pretty much as they want on community development projects. I think we need to triple or quadruple that program to help communities really start building things up. And if we do that, uh, talk about letting people see what you're doing. Like within the matter of a year or two, we could really start seeing some progress as far as, okay, these public investments, we're starting to see them in the neighborhoods. There's new parks, there's new sidewalks, there's new things happening. I think we need to do that immediately. I thought we fumbled that when it came to the stimulus package that we did many years ago. We had, you know, it was almost a trillion dollars and there was only a hundred and 100 plus billion for transportation infrastructure. I mean, we should have come right back and done another transportation bill. We should have pumped money in the community development projects so that people could see what was happening. So your question, sir, just on, on, the, on the, um, the process side. So the, the comparison that I was making in New York, that PPI made in their analysis, was, was not with China. It was with <laughs> Berlin. It was with Germany, where they have strong unions and the, you know stronger uh, environmental uh, uh, regime on par with ours. And so the, the concept for us, I think, as Democrats, is the process. How do you streamline the process? I've, I've got one of the best union voting records in the, in the Congress. Uh, I think part of doing this is that we're going to create good paying jobs that really are the last middle class jobs left are, are private sector union folks in the building and construction trades that are doing really well uh, today. Um, how do we how do we streamline the process? And it's kind of like Costco, you know, where Costco treats their workers well. They're concerned. They're more about the shareholders. But when you look at Costco's process of of uh, getting goods and everything else, they take care of the customer. They take care of the worker. But the process of of doing their business is super super tight, super super streamlined. So that's what I want the government to do. Like take care of our workers. Take care of the customers. Be efficient. Have, be impactful, but squeeze this process. Use the technology that we have today to make government work. And we can't do what Roosevelt did, you know, in the 1930s. We've got to do what Roosevelt would do today. And today, I think this would be the approach. Thank you.
very much. Oh, this, this is a great conversation. I, I see a lot of hands up. I'm, I'm sorry to say that we we don't have time. Uh, Jeff has, has given me one more. We have one more. Uh, why don't can we do real quickly just because this gentleman and then this gentleman just real quick uh, questions or comments? What would this guy do? Oh, man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I don't need my my name is Bob Pressing and I serve in the Iowa legislature. I'm also ranking member of the Transportation Committee. And one of the big discussions we had is rural America. I didn't hear much of that discussion, it was about the cities. But in Iowa, about 70 of our counties are losing population of the 99. And it's actually growing, it's getting worse. And one of the investments that would benefit, you know, you have primary railroads and you have secondary railroads. Well, if you look at Iowa today, the secondary railroads, the infrastructure is depleted. And it's having a huge negative impact on Iowa's rural economy. And so we had a bill this year to try and get some state dollars to create some kind of incentive to, to do this. And there are railroads that are companies that are willing to invest in the infrastructure. But if, if you look at a railroad, you know, the width of the rail, is one of the key factors of how much it can it can support. And so, and then, you know, the infrastructure, the, the, the ground and all the support pieces are, are just dying. And so, I, my sense is that would be a good step for us here in rural Iowa uh, to help with railroad for transporting grain, uh, getting businesses established in our, in our rural area. So, I, I, that's one area I think is uh, overlooked fairly significantly, particularly in our state. Thank you. Well, uh, Liz, we've had a lot of great co uh, questions and co comments, and I'm, I'm told we're out of time, so I apologize to all of you who didn't get a chance to get yours. Thank you for, for uh, you know. But I do want to take one second to maybe try to come back uh, to Gary's question, uh, which I think is fundamental here. We know we've got a strong <coughs> intellectual policy case, <coughs> excuse me, but how do you uh, do a better job of making this a compelling voting issue for Americans? How do you, how do you six it up to get back to the topic? And uh, so uh, I thought a lot about this. But look, you know, there have been times in American history where this has been the central issue. Remember the internal improvements in the uh, 1800s, Henry Clay, the Whig Party, uh, Abraham Lincoln, all of these politicians ran every year on internal improvements. We've got to develop the, in the internal country so that all of your states, you know, I'm, I'm from Virginia, I'm on the coast, but all of your states depended on canals, turnpikes, et cetera, and rail when it came along. So that was the great debate in American politics, how much you were going to, who was going to pay for internal improvements needed to bring the prosperity of the East uh, and, and the development into the rest of the country. So we know that it is an important issue to people, and I think if enough, if there's a critical mass of people from this part of the world, where you really need the infrastructure investment more because you're not because you're you know you're uh, you're outside of the prosperity in effect that's happening in these places I talked about the, where it's clustered uh, and you, you know Obama talked about nation building I think that's the right concept that's what we're talking about in lieu of military spending I don't think we should slash defense but I do think we've got to uh, we've got to make this a national priority that it isn't right now and my final comment to your uh, this gentleman's point is that. I wish I could say it was all the Republicans' fault and that it was easy, that the easy solution was tax the rich and pay for all the stuff. It didn't. Democrats don't, they, there are trade offs that Democrats protect too. One of them is the present consumption spending on all of our big entitlements. And to the extent that you're protecting that spending, you're not tapping money that we need to invest in infrastructure. So the real trade offs is my point. Uh, both parties have to face up to it. We ought to be honest about that because we've got a, a little bit of a problem in our own party about finding the wherewithal to do it. Uh, with that, let me just ask our, our distinguished group of uh, speakers here to give us uh, closing comments. We'll just run to me from you down, and, uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll click, conclude this program. I just want to thank everybody for coming. I think we've got a lot of work. We've got great people that want to get involved in this, and I think it's just a matter of doing it, and I love, you know, um, Mahoney and, and Gary, we, we have to, and I've said this in our my caucus, 
over and over and over again, but we need to get our messaging down. And so um, I would love to work with our local folks to see if we can't do that better. We lost our governorship when Joni Ernst came out with making cookies, jumping on the trampoline, and Fred Wan talked about decreasing tax rebates to the corporate income. Those were came out the same week, and guess what? We lost. Perfect example. I missed that commercial, so I have to squeeze the face. Yeah. Um, I just I want I want to say thank you. Obviously, this is a critical issue. I just say keep in mind that uh, rural America, urban America small towns, mid-sized towns, uh, we're all in the same boat. And so there's no reason why this should not be a national agenda around us being competitive about putting all of these towns uh, on the, the map, on the menu for growth. And how do we tie the infrastructure investments to the private sector investments, to the education investments, to you know the community development investments. It's, it's all a big push to plug in these communities that have been left behind over the last 30 or 40 years and there's more of us than there are of them. And if we can get together and stop letting people divide us uh, by who's black, who's white, who's gay, who's straight, who's from the north, who's from the south, who's from a big city, who's from a small town, uh, we, can, we can flip this thing. And it, it's all about coming together. So thanks for having me. I want to finally say that um, you know, we're at a critical point in time uh, in the history of this country uh, and also in the history of our city. Um, we're working hard to try to make sure that no community, no resident, no neighborhood gets left behind. You know, shiny, brand new buildings are great for attracting, uh, but fixing up our neighborhoods, working with our core infrastructure of some of the neighborhoods that have been left behind has to be a priority for making sure that we keep people and that making sure that the quality of life expands to every part of our city. So we're looking for partners, we're looking for the senator, we're looking for the state reps, uh, and we're looking to partner so that we can empower our community. So thank you, uh, PBI, for continuing that conversation. And thank all of you 